Topo Athletic is committed to lifelong health and better movement. Topo builds running shoes for those who get out there every day, regardless of weather, speed, energy, or mood. Their distinctive fit and feel combines instinctive human movement with modern performance and lightweight comfort to help you keep going, keep trying, and keep moving. Discover the Topo difference and step into a run experience unlike any other. Hey everybody, Jason Bahamundi, founder and co-owner of Run Tribe Bike. Want to thank you for tuning in. Really appreciate you uh, following along with our fireside chats. We have been uh, hosting these for over a year now. It's amazing that we've come this far in such a short period of time. Today we were supposed to have uh, Dr. Lauren Lapierre join us. Unfortunately, we've been having some difficult some technical difficulties. And so we won't be uh, having a conversation, but I will leave the comment section open. We can chat for a few minutes if you have questions, Um, but wanted to give you some updates on Run Tri Bike uh, company as a whole. And I see some friends out there uh, joining us. So thank you guys for for tuning in. Please feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, First things first, um, my partner Om Gandhi just posted a reel about a docu-series, docu-film, documentary, whatever you want to call it, we haven't figured it out yet, uh, about my uh, comeback to the 100 mile distance. Um, We don't have a name for it yet, but our goal is to try to produce some uh, documentaries, five, 10 minute movies about athletes and what they're going through leading up to their event, during the event, and then post event so that you guys can get an inside look to how ordinary athletes like you and I are accomplishing extraordinary things. So this weekend, I uh, take myself out uh, to Auburn, California, and we'll run uh, the 100 mile uh, distance of the Canyons 100. And we'll be filming it all along the way and uh, editing. And so hopefully we'll have a, like I said, five to 10 minute movie for you guys. Go check out the trailer, if you will, on our reels. Uh, In addition to that, we will be announcing a new contest tomorrow that will be tied to our digital magazine, and our next issue comes out on May 15th, and we're really excited about it. The topic is going to be essentially about um, journeys. Oh, and it looks like Lauren is on there, so I'm going to invite her here in a second so we can have a chat. Um, So great, so we'll actually have uh, an actual uh, fireside chat today, but we will have a contest announced tomorrow. And um, it's going to be super exciting. So make sure you tune into that. We're, we're really fired up about it. it. Like I said, it is attached to our digital magazine, which drops on May 15th through our newsletter. So make sure you subscribe to our newsletter. We will have a really cool story coming out uh, on the last day of the month with Brooke Gowdy and uh, starting to follow her on her way to the uh, Race Across the Sky Leadville 100 mountain bike race. And so... We're really excited about that um, exclusive newsletter drop as well. Um, Enjoying the Journey is the series. We've already covered Christy Concepcion in the start of her journey to the uh, her first 100 mile race. We've covered Marley Blonsky in the last one and her journey to Unbound. And now we'll have Brooke Gowdy on her journey to, uh, excuse me, to level 100. So let me get Lauren on here so we can uh, of fireside chat so if you have questions for lauren please make sure you put them into the comments section um and we'll make sure to get them addressed with her perfect timing how are you lauren good how are you I apologize for running a few minutes late there's a sick dog and a lot of unexpected things happening in the house <laughs> no worries it's, it's the beauty of a live show we run into these things all the time and it happens right yeah so i <laughs> Well, I'm just super excited to have you here. We have been corresponding um, probably for a little bit over a year now, if I'm if I'm recalling correctly. So it's really exciting to be able to have you on our fireside chat, so um, we can dive into who Lauren is, you know, what you do to help runners, and then I really want to talk about your retreat that will be coming up here uh, soon. That's taking place in Vermont. Sound cool? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, thank you. We're excited to be here. Feel free to interrupt me all along the way too. I like to talk, so if you want to get your, uh, you want to get something in, jump in. Like, don't don't hold back. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So you asked who I am. Um, well, my name is Dr. Lauren Lapierre. I'm a. Um, let me fix 
my phone for a second and see me better. There we go. Um, so yeah, my name is Dr. Lauren Lapierre. I am a physical therapist by training. Um, I'm a runner rehab specialist and running coach. I've been running since I was 12 years old and ran competitively in high school, ran throughout college as well for a D1 um, university here at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I'm currently in Rhode Island right now, and I took a long hi hiatus actually after my collegiate running career because I ended up like having a really bad relationship with running at that point, um, made it a lot more about what expectations were that, or I thought they were that were being put on me versus my enjoyment and my love for the sport. And I think that in the combination of not having an individualized training, training kind of being dished out at the collegiate level, which is typically just like very like one size fits all. Um, I had a lot of injuries and uh, never had a healthy season. I always was in the training room, um, getting some work done on me, seeing physical therapists, going to doctors. Uh, so after my collegiate running career ended and I was going into grad school, I took like three years off. And it wasn't until I was in a clinical in Boston and the Boston Marathon was going on and everybody around me was signing up for it or had, not they had been signing up for it, but they had signed up for it or they were running for a charity. And I was looking at all these people and I'm like, oh, they can do this. I can do this. Like I can absolutely run the Boston Marathon. Um, and I did something that most people don't do. I signed up for a marathon, trained for a summer. Um, and by like the hair of my neck, I was able to actually qualify for my, for Boston, my first marathon, which is not typical. Um, I would say even though I qualified, I want to preface that that was not my best marathon, even though I qualified because the way that I went about training for that marathon is so different from now, like almost, God, five years later, I've learned so much along the way, not only training myself, but training other athletes and all the research and things that I've done, um, that I've learned how to better balance all of those things. And that's one of the things that gave me confidence to do the back to back, which I just did with um, New York and then Houston. So I'm an avid runner. I obviously love running enough to make it my business, which is the personalized running doc. And my goal in life is just to like continue to help other runners feel as inspired and empowered in their bodies the way that I wish someone helped me feel in the medical field as a coach, um, because that wasn't always the case. It, it sometimes felt very alienating. And I don't want anybody to have that experience or any doubts going further into their running career because everybody that joins the sport can be a part of the sport. It's just a matter of understanding your body and knowing how to train for yourself. Tell me what you mean by the, uh, what you said earlier, which was you had a bad relationship with running. What made it a bad relationship with running? Yeah. So I, like I said, I think a lot of the expectations and, or the ideas of what the expectations were put on me in terms of how I should be performing that my, what I felt was my only value to the team that I was um, on at the time was like if I was scoring points and if I was like actually making points in the meets, which I often wasn't. I was not one of the top people. I was usually, I, I was a D1 runner, but I was back of the pack D1 runner. Um, and I was okay with that coming into D1 and knowing that I had work to grow and like kind of like a place to kind of work on. Um, but I think as my time and my relationship with running kind of grew from there, I didn't, I felt less valuable than those people that were at the front scoring the points, coming in first, X, Y, and Z, all of that type of thing. Um, and so I think I was always just trying to prove that I still had value and that made me maybe push a little bit too hard in workouts where I shouldn't have. It made me run all of my runs at like 7.30 or faster. Like there was no run that I did in college that was like slower than that. Cause if it was slower than that, I was like hiding it from my coach. Cause I was like, oh my God, if she sees that, she's gonna think I'm slow and that I can't perform. And then 
that's not a good thing. And so always running my runs too fast, no matter what it was. And I think that's that in combination with a very like large increase of volume, which is very common for going from like high school to college. Um, that just kind of exacerbated my body's like inability to like handle the load. Um, it wasn't prepared for that. So that in the end, and kind of impacted my relationship with running because I thought that there was something wrong with me. I thought it was my body's fault. And that's kind of what people were also telling me. Um, I would go to the training room and something that was told to me that I, I wrote in one of my articles is that at 22 years old, I was told, maybe you're too old for running. Maybe you're too old to be a com like competitive. Like, what do you mean? I'm 22. <laughs> I, have, I haven't even started yet. Like, I don't what this it like what that means to me at this point because i have so much more growth to to have in this sport and i mean we see even elites now breaking records and like going so far um later and later in their career and that like we really need to take this like ageist mindset away from things because people can still perform later in life yeah um, i mean really kind of figure right training that works for people at those ages and at that experience level. Yeah, I think the whole thing has changed because I didn't get started in running until I was 34. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, before you got on, I, I was telling the audience that I'm about to go back to the 100 mile distance race and I, I, turn, I turned 50 at the end of this year, right? So to be told 22 that you're too old for running, too old for running, excuse me, is crazy. Yeah. Right. So how do you take those lessons from what you learned D1 being told you're too old and apply that with you in a coaching philosophy for the athletes you work with? Uh, uh, so I always approach it now in terms of like, I don't ask like whenever my athletes kind of tell me like they ran a race and they got like a certain, I'm like, I don't, I try to not show any emotion. Cause like there may be a feeling that I have like, I'm like, Oh, they could have done better than that. But I'm like, nope, we're not kind of facing it with that. We're going, how do you feel about that? And 95% of the time they're like, I feel great. Like maybe, and they, and then they'll kind of go into the, the delve of like, these are the things that it really went well for me. And like, I know that I could have done better here. So like people already intuitively know what they need to work on. We just need to give them the grace to actually feel accomplished in what they actually were able to do and then then we can tackle the things that oh yeah there's always improvements that need to be made um so i try to show up in a way that like allows that grace and support um and understanding as well as like i don't if i think somebody can go faster that's great but if that's not their goals that doesn't that doesn't need to be put on them um and i I think a lot of what I do looks into the mindset side of things as well to make sure that my runners are always in a healthy mindset. I was just having a conversation with one of like my longest standing clients, I think last week. Um, and like he had an incredible couple of years through COVID. He had just started running a couple years, like maybe a year or so two before that went into COVID, like was one of those runners that just like, picked it up, did crazy things, like was PRing in his marathon, PRing in the half marathon, doing all of these virtual races and like incredible. Um, and then he got like so excited essentially because he kept PRing and all these things that he was like, let me push, let me add another race onto the docket. Let me put another thing on the calendar. And he was never really kind of giving himself like an off season or a break. And it finally kind of caught up to him at the end of last year where he was like, I am not, not really kind of like meeting expectations anymore. And this is not becoming fun. And I just need to like, it, it almost was like life made him take like a, a, like pull the emergency break because he's now like, I just need to focus on the fun of it. Yeah. I can't or on it. I can't look for a PR and everything. I need to just take a step back and I always try to make sure that we're having those conversations so that it's clear enough that like we're not overextending ourselves and and we're keeping that balance because I think the biggest difference between high school and collegiate running 
and those that I work with that are running later in life, whether that's 20 something years old, 34 years old, 50 years old, there's other priorities that come first in life sometimes. And yeah. we need everything of that. Running is not always going to be the thing that we can put 100% of our effort in, even if it's what we want to be doing, which most runners are doing that, but we don't have the ability to just kind of negate those other responsibilities that come up in life. So we have to acknowledge that and sometimes accept that life is going to tell us like, hey, this can't be the priority right now. You need to shift energy. You need to focus on what's in front of you. And then when things level out a bit, when things balance a little bit more, then you can come back into it and you can put more energy and put more effort and go for those things that you're looking for, those goals. Exactly. For the Designed for running adventures on a variety of surfaces, the Catula Exospikes footwear traction are at home on ice and snow, as well as on dry, rocky ground. 12 ultra durable tungsten carbide spikes provide an impressive amount of grip when you need it, and stand up to rocks and other abrasive trail features when you don't. Exospikes will inspire you to follow the trail less traveled, even when it's covered in ice. For more information, visit Catula.com. Exactly. For those of you that are just joining us, my name is Jason Bahamani. I'm the founder and one of the co-owners of Run, Try, Bike. We're being joined by the personalized running doc, Lauren LaPierre, discussing just, you know, running in general, her practice, as well as um, a retreat that she's hosting for female athletes in Vermont uh, this spring, I think spring, um, but we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, one of the things that you said, and two, actually two keywords that you said there, which are give your grace and fun. And I, and I think that what we have done at, you know, as athletes is we've put so much pressure on ourselves to perform, whether that's go longer or go faster, doesn't matter. That <clears throat> if we don't see some sort of like linear progression, we don't think we're doing it right. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes no fun. And then we drop out of the sport, right? So how do we encourage people to have more fun with this stuff? Like, let's go have fun, man. Like, we should be happy. <laughs> <clears throat> and telling jokes and enjoying ourselves. That's not to say you don't do hard work, right? Go do the interval runs, go do the two, three, four hour runs, whatever it is. But man, we should be laughing and having fun and telling stories about this stuff. How do we bring that back How do, to athletes who have lost that? So one of the things that I encourage my athletes to do is like, I tell them don't pull the trigger on races. <laughs> and this is something I've also personally learned when like I get off of that marathon high or whatever race that I was just running and I'm like, oh, I want to do it again. Even if it's, especially if it didn't go well, I'm like, oh, I got to do it again. I got to redeem myself. I got to make a decision. And it's delaying that, that like pull the trigger moment and like actually like sitting in your feelings and like absorbing what you just went through, what just happened again being able to assess and evaluate like good things, bad things and different things. Um, and only pulling the trigger, like when it's absolutely necessary to do that. I think that again, takes the pressure off and like allows you to just show up for training for training purposes right. for the purpose of enjoying the work and the effort versus, Oh, I'm doing this because I have to like get X goal at a race. Um, I have, potentially like I put this out there that I'm potentially doing this and I still don't even know myself because like I'm waiting for me to feel confident enough to be able to like pull the trigger on it but I've thought about doing California International Marathon later this year I have not pulled the trigger on that and I know that the marathon fills up but I have not pulled the trigger on it because I'm like I'm not ready yet I don't feel confident yet and I don't want to put that pressure on myself even so far out, knowing that I have another marathon on the docket, especially after last year when I spent so much time training for a marathon. Um, so I think that's one way is to like, before pulling the trigger on another race, sit in the race that you just had and allow yourself to like actually assess it and see what went well, see what didn't, and just like get back into training for the sake of training and enjoying that like either alone time or time with friends. Um, another, that kind of brings me into the other way is like schedule runs with friends. I think our running can be a very solitary sport and can be helpful for that meditation time. Um, but I think it's also super helpful to be 
just around a community of other runners that feel the same way. I'm going to a workout tomorrow um, with a local run group and I don't think I'm going to know, I may know like one person there, two people, not a ton. Um, and I'm purely just going to be able to do the workout in an environment that's going to like push me, challenge me, but also like be relatively fun. Um, not because I want to like specifically get X goal out of the workout. It's just to be in that environment. So I think that brings more fun back. Um, and then explore a little bit. I think we also get so mundane in terms of like the routes that we run and like how we run add more like speed play into it. If that's not something that you normally do run a hillier route, go run on some trails, like make it fun for yourself so that you explore new ways of running because there's so many different ways that you can show up to this sport. Yeah. I mean, variety is the spice of life, right? So by, by using those additional types of opportunities for speed work or whatever it is, you know, I run long distances, right? So it guaranteed I'm going to be walking. So I do a lot of hiking, right? And, and it's part of my training plan. And then you can incorporate the speed work and the tempo runs and everything else. But hiking is like one of my favorite because there's going to be a lot of hiking during a hundred mile race. And so, you know, I would encourage athletes that if you're looking to, if things feel boring, mundane, like Lauren says roots, I say routes, figure out, the, <laughs> figure out the route you want to run <laughs> um, and change it up, you know, go find something else and go find other groups and clubs. Cause there's plenty of people out there that are willing to do it. Um, you recently wrote a series of articles for us about back-to-back -back marathon training and, and you're very vulnerable in it. And so I really appreciate you doing that. And I'd like to get into that a little bit, yeah. you know, in terms of vulnerability for you. And um, have you gone back to read the articles after they've gone live and, and thought to yourself, man, I shouldn't have said that, or I wish I would have said something else instead? Uh, I was just reading the first article the other day and I was like, no, this still resonates. <laughs> like, this still, yeah, this, this still is pretty accurate to like how I was feeling and like the experience of it all. And like, I think it's, I think it accurately shows the amount of growth that I also feel that I've gone through in the past year specifically with running. Um, because I've, I've been a runner, like I said, since I was 12 years old and like this past year, I feel more than ever, I have been able to come to the point where like, I am enjoying the process more than racing. Like I like racing and it can be enjoyable. It can be really nerve wracking though. And I've had a lot of race anxiety in the past. Um, but I think as soon as I started to let go of like the actual, like, as soon as my enjoyment came less from like, again, the, the extrinsic goal, the outcome of the race, it was more about like, I really just enjoy showing up, working hard, feeling strong, feeling fast, feeling empowered, like knowing what my body is capable of. And like, that makes me feel good. And that consistency makes me feel good versus any other goal that I have, um, whether that be like specifically in running or fitness or whatever it may be. Um, so I, yeah, I would say that my, my the way that I wrote that article, like that's just how I talk. And so like, it's me just like thinking, I don't know if that's like the proper way to like write a magazine article, but that's what came out. <laughs> so, so you said race anxiety. So I'm the guy at the start line who cracks jokes, you know, because that's how I deal with race anxiety. And I can tell the person next to me is like so bottled up and tense, you know, if you want to make fun, like we're going to go have fun. So let's crack a joke, yep. right? Uh, how do you break your race anxiety when you're at the start line? Um, so now like surprising, like not, I, know, I shouldn't say surprisingly, I've done a lot of like work with a therapist and I think that even though it wasn't directly like running related, it was like just personal therapy. I think a lot of the work that I've done with her to recognize my anxious habits and then how those were actually bleeding into my running um, really helped me to deal with that race anxiety without even actually like actively having to deal with it. And so I was actually really worried um, when I did my tune up for New York at the beginning of October, I actually had like a lot of race anxiety because I hadn't, done a race since the summer um and i was like i have no idea how this is gonna go and like this is gonna tell me if my goal is realistic for new york or not and like who 
freaking knows. Like I, like that's really what the, the possibility is. And I was doing it on a tough course knowing that New York was also tough. So I'm like, I have no idea of what's going to happen here. Um, and so I actually had a, like, I had to like actively stop myself at one mo moment. I actually had one of my runners actually with me and he was there to like cheer me on. And I like had to stop myself and be like, Lauren, you need to breathe, like, and you need to like take a couple deep breaths. So I did that and like brought my heart rate down. So I was like, you're wasting so much energy being anxious right now. Like you need to conserve that for the race. Um, and then I don't know, there's something about when like they like the announcer lets you know that like you should be lining up at the race um, starting line that like it almost just turns like a switch in my mind. And it's like, all right, like blinders on, like you're going for it. You, you know what your plan is you know the route, you know all these things because you've done all this research, you've planned ahead. Now it's just time to go out and see what's possible and see how you feel. Um, and I walked away from that race like actually feeling pretty confident even though it wasn't the goal that I wanted. Um, I didn't get that goal, but like I ran really well for like a good portion of the race. And I was like, okay, this is making me feel more confident. And then New York and Houston, I didn't have actually any race anxiety, like, leading up to those days. I was just purely excited. I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. Like, this is going to be hard, obviously. <laughs> Marathons are hard. Long-distance racing is hard. 5Ks are hard, um, which I think 5Ks are completely undervalued in our community now. Like, everybody values the marathon, and it's like, also. Like, for anybody listening to this, I've said it a million times. I'll say it a million times more. I would much rather run a hundred miles than run a five. Period. <laughs> it's, story. A, it's a different type of burn. I can and I enjoy being in pain for 25 minutes. Like I just don't. Yeah. Right. I'll go run for 25 hours. I'm good. Right. Give me, I'm a candle, not a match. I'll deal with the dull pain, not with the acute pain. It's yeah. So like, like marathon long distance races, it's that slow burn. So like you're pretty comfortable for like the first like couple of hours. And then it's like, <laughs> end of it that you're like wow okay now i'm feeling it um like slowly builds up over time five keys so like marathon they say like it's a comfortably hard pace five keys are just hard they are really <laughs> hard really hard the entire time your muscles immediately start burning your lungs start burning <laughs> the level of effort to train for a 5k is actually in some time like a period of harder there's way more time commitment necessary and like diligency in terms of planning and things like that for a marathon because anybody could go out and quote unquote race a 5k but the actual like execution and the level of effort that goes into a 5k so much harder so much harder to like get better and there's so much less time that you can't make as many mistakes as you could in a marathon or a half marathon as you can in a 5k like you can't make any mistakes if you make a mistake in your fueling in your um hydration in the way you tie your shoes like that could make or break your race and like that if you go out too fast which everybody does it could make or break your race where a marathon you can make up for some of those things you can account for some of those things to potentially happen and know that you still have x amount of hours x amount of miles to kind of kind of backtrack on those things um yeah so there's margin got into that. <laughs> there's little margin for error at the 5k yeah exactly so i'm running 100 miles if it takes me 26 hours i've got time to make right there's opportunities to figure things out so that give me that all day, every day, and twice on Tuesday. Um, one of the things that we had um, exchanged conversations about, we've been talking about, and you mentioned that you're coaching men, but you have this upcoming. And questions I wrote for myself to ask you is, um, why is it um, why is it important to you that this be an all female running retreat? Cool. So. I am like super passionate about like advocating for females. Um, like honestly, if I, I love working with like all of my clients, male and females. And so like, I, and I have some really great male clients, but like supporting females in this sport. Hold on one second. Um, the live females. We got Mark and we got all kinds of stuff. <laughs> um supporting females in 
like the athletic and the running community, I, again, I think this stems from a, a big experience that I had when it comes to body image, when it comes to understanding my period, when it comes to, and, and like my menstrual cycle as a whole, and then later cycles down the line. Um, I think it is one, not talked about. And when it is talked about, it's talked about in a negative connotation or an embarrassment or this thing that we should kind of shy away from. Or it's, ta it's taboo. And I don't think that being a female should be taboo. <laughs> like, these are part of like, these are natural parts of our physiology. Like, I mean, I'm going to like, branch it into like a different like topic that runners are usually pretty open about and that's like talking about like your pre-run poops or your post-run poops like or during run poops like <laughs> runners, runners talk about that so openly but yet we don't talk about like for females like it's such an embarrassment to talk about like our menstrual cycle and like those things like that like maybe in like a small poop like that happens but at a, at a large scale like that doesn't happen coaches aren't talking about it male coaches which is pro predominantly in the sport definitely aren't talking about it especially with the population that really needs to like understand it and see how it really impacts you for years and years to come what you're doing in your pubescent years um and so i wanted to make my initial retreat primarily females because i want to support this growth and this idea and yes, I'm going to be essentially educating adults and most of the females are my age or a little bit older. Um, but I don't think that there is like, you can't, like, you can't learn this information too late in life because you can start to make changes. I 100% believe if you give your body just like a little bit, like just an inch, it'll go a mile with it and it'll take it and it'll run with it. So if we can just instill like a couple of better habits that support the female physiology when it comes to training, because we do have to train differently. We do have to like eat differently. We do have to be mindful of sleep differently um, versus men. Your body's just going to thank you so much. And I think, again, that's something that I've personally been experimenting with. And I see such a difference, not only in my training, but like how I can show up in my life and how I can feel on a daily basis because of, like how I support myself and how I advocate for myself on a daily basis now in terms of like how I need to eat, how I need to sleep, all of these different things. Awesome. For those of you that are just joining us, my name is Jason Bahamundi. I'm the founder and one of the co-owners of Run, Try, Bike. Thank you for joining us for our fireside chat. We are talking with Dr. Lauren LaPierre, the personalized running doc, about currently about her retreat that's coming up. We're going to get some more information from her about that. But if you have questions for her, please feel free to drop them into the comment box there or tap the little question mark and ask, and I'll be sure to get them over to her. Um, so the retreat, it's taking place in Vermont. What date does it take place and how many, and do you have openings? Let me, before we get too detailed. Yes. Yeah, so we still have um, five beds available. Um, there's 10 beds total and it is in Bridge, um, Bridge Corners or Bridgewater Corners, Vermont, which is right next to Killington. Um, and so it's in the Green Mountains and it's June 15th to the 18th. Fantastic. And you talked about, you know, why it was important to, to do this um, for women and why you wanted to do it that way. What was the inspiration behind it that you were like, you know what, this would be a great idea? Uh, so I've been working for the past couple of years um with two separate running camps in the local area and I never got to go to a running camp when I was in high school and like I've always wanted to go so one me getting to go and work at these camps was like oh I get to go to camp and I'm so excited about this um and I just had like an absolute ball with these kids who, again, all of them love running, all of them were super inspired by running and like decided to spend a week away from their family and their friends to go and run in like Vermont and in New Hampshire. Um, and so I wanted to create that atmosphere for adults because I, I grew up running and I didn't have that experience, but I know that again, so many runners come into this sport later in life. I wanted to give them that opportunity to create those memories, to create that experience 
of like, again, being like a child again and having those moments of play and joy and fun. Like there's nothing competitive about the retreat that I'm creating. It is simply just going to be like a great bonding experience or like wanting it to be also extremely relaxive. Um, re yeah. Um, for all of the participants involved, like there's a jacuzzi there. We're going to have fires every night with s'mores. Um, and we're going to have a bunch of downtime in between the activities in terms of like the physical activities as well as the different like seminars that we're going to be running so that people can also just like decompress and enjoy being away for that short period of time um but yeah that was one of the reasons why is because like i i always wanted to go to camp when i was younger never got the opportunity went as an adult and like i had just as much fun with the kids as they had and i wanted to provide that opportunity for other runners I love it. I love it. So um, I know people obviously can find you here on Instagram, but, yeah. and you've been putting together some, uh, by the way, you put together some really cool videos, right? When you're running around the track and stuff. So I don't know if you have a drone pilot that you hire or what, but the videos are really, really cool. Do you still post some of your like workouts and stuff like to help with prehab type stuff on YouTube as well? Um, so I haven't ever put them on YouTube. I do have a couple of videos up there um, that are like public right now for people to be able to view. Um, but that is a great idea that I could definitely hear. Um, but yeah, of, like, idea. free content and th things like that that people can get from me whenever I'm in like the middle of a training cycle, I usually do end up posting like some things about either the prehab work that I'm doing the strength training or the workouts that I'm doing. Um, or I put it into like my newsletter, um, that I send out on a weekly basis. And that usually goes a little bit more in depth than what I can put onto Instagram. Um, but I also am very open in my conversations with anybody that is following me or just has questions. So if you do have questions about X, Y, and Z, like I've had a coach ask me like, Hey, how would you modify the workout that you just did for high schoolers? And I was like, great question. Like, let me give you some like options here. Um, because this would be like a really intense workout for like a freshman, but for like a senior, maybe not. Um, so I have those up open conversations in my DMS as well. Awesome. So can they subscribe to your newsletter through your website? Uh, yes, there is a, um, link on my website for them to subscribe. They can also just DM me their email and I can add them directly in. And your website address is, uh, it's the personalized running doc.com. Awesome. So we try to keep this show to about 45 minutes. So we've got eight minutes of Q and a that we like to do rapid fire. Okay. And it revolves around food and fun because you know what we want, we're bringing fun back to endurance sports. You ready? Oh, yes. Awesome. So first things first, this will determine whether or not we continue to have a working relationship. If you get this answer, correct. <laughs> Pineapple on pizza. Yay or nay. Uh, no. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> like, this is so like polarized. Like. No, it's boyfriend. not. No, it's not polarized. All day long. <laughs> People pineapple on pizza are just wrong. That's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> I, I have to get it to say a justification for this. I don't like pineapple as it is as a texture, which is one of the reasons why I don't like it on pizza. I don't like, so I don't like pineapple at all. For those of you that are pineapple and pizza fans, I don't like pineapple at all. I like pineapple. I will not eat pineapple because of the texture of pineapple. So like, it's a texture thing for me, awesome. um, but definitely a pizza fan. <laughs> so what other foods fall into the, I'm not eating it because of the texture. <laughs> what other foods? Yeah. Um, so I don't eat, like I, I do but I try not to eat just bananas. Like I don't like banana, the take texture of bananas um, because I just like had a bad experience as a child. And now I will never eat like a banana, but I'll put it in a smoothie. I'll eat it in banana bread. Like I just can't really take, like if I can't taste the banana again, it's like, it's a strong taste to me and I just don't like it. And again, it has like kind of like a stringy consistency sometimes I'm like, Nope, that's not my thing. <laughs> I love it. By the way, for those of you that are here, uh, one of our clients, Switchback, just posted that they have a pineapple gator. So feel free to go out and purchase the pineapple, the gator that has the pineapples on it, because um, it's the only place that they belong, certainly not on pizza. 
<laughs> candy corn. Is it a real candy or is it just earwax with sugar? Earwax with sugar. Yes. <laughs> Not a candy corn person, but I am amazed at the fact that I didn't know until an adult that if you put all like the candy corns together, it creates a like an ear of corn. I didn't know that. Yeah, that means you have to actually buy it to make it happen. So we're not doing that. <laughs> Peeps, are they nothing more than dust with glitter on them? Or do you actually enjoy peeps? I can have like one peep, but like aside from that, they're yeah, just they're just like they're sugar. <laughs> yeah, they're awful. So um Kim, who has been on this show before, Crapsha, she told us that if you put two peeps in the microwave and you put toothpicks in their beaks, that they have their peep jousting when you put the microwave on. So if you get bored, give that a whirl. That's a great use. <laughs> Others told us that stale peeps are, are the best way to eat them. So I don't know how you take something that's bad and make it worse and somehow it equals good, but so be it. I tried it. There's a video up there. I tried it. It's terrible. It's awful. Okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for it because I probably are won't. Are you a licorice fan? I am not. At no. all. So no red, no black licorice whatsoever. No. What about circus peanuts? Circus peanuts. Like just like the bag of peanuts? No. Like no. The big... orange. They were made by Brock's. They're the orange. They look, they're like styrofoam. They're like, they look like they've been spray painted with like this terrible orange color. You have to go to like a. Ever eaten them so I can't give yeah. an opinion. They're like, it's like the stuff that Amazon uses to pack your, your pack. <laughs> like the styrofoam, so it's terrible. Are you, is red velvet a real flavor or is it just chocolate cake with red food dye? Food dye. Yeah. I just <laughs> Yeah. Like, people are like, oh, I love red velvet. I'm like, oh, you like chocolate cake. Thanks. <laughs> Pretty chocolate cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite cake? Do you have one? Uh, so there is a um, bakery here in Rhode Island called Wright's Farm Bakery, and it has um, strawberry shortcake. And they do either just like traditional strawberry shortcake or they do chocolate strawberry shortcake. But like the thing that makes it is they, it's like a dairy farm. So they create um, their own whipped cream. And it's just, it's so much better than like, frosting on a cake in my opinion it's just so much lighter and like you don't feel as like heavy or guilty eating it afterwards um but it's also delicious so yeah awesome do you like pie are you a pie person uh pumpkin, pumpkin. pie but that's other it pie, not you probably won't see me going for that on like the dessert table what's your uh, uh favorite pre-race pre-race meal um <laughs> So if I have the ability to have like my normal breakfast, it'll probably be that. Um, if not, what is your normal breakfast? My normal breakfast is I have like half a cup of yogurt with um, kind peanut butter and granola, and I have a scoop of peanut butter powder in it, and then frozen wild blueberries. The wild it has to be wild blueberries. I don't like regular blueberries, but like wild blueberries are different, and they're better. again in my opinion. <laughs> um so if i have the time like a later race in the morning i can eat that because it's pretty dense um otherwise i'm pretty traditional and going for like your um bagel with peanut butter on it or peanut butter and jelly combination to make it easily digestible so now that you've done the race what's what's the go-to uh post-race recovery meal or post-race i'm gonna eat everything i can possibly get my hands on meal um um, I think after New York, uh, I had a burger. Yeah, I had like a burger and the place that we went to had fried avocados. Delicious. It was amazing. Um, I had food poisoning after Houston, so I wasn't eating anything. <laughs> I got Pedialyte delivered from my coach and like that. That's what I ate and drank for the evening afterwards. So it kind of depends where I am, but like I essentially kind of like do research beforehand and I'm like, what do I want? And like, where do I want to try? And I knew where we were staying in New York, we were really close to a restaurant called Harlem Public. And I had been there before and I was like, I want their avocado fries. Like, that's what I want. <laughs> so. 
Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to getting more articles from you on our website. Yeah, Every, check out her Instagram account so you can um, sign up for her revive retreat for females. Um, and then also check out all the prehab exercise videos that she puts out there. They're wonderful and they will help you stay injury free throughout your endurance sports training and racing. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Bye.